Light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. Let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. This here voice of mine is for singing songs of freedom. This here voice of mine is for singing songs of freedom. This here voice of mine is for singing songs of freedom. Sing them loud, sing them loud, sing them loud. These here hands of mine are for voting tyrants out. These here hands of mine are for voting tyrants out. These here hands of mine are for voting tyrants out. So vote them out, vote them out, vote them out. These here feet of mine march me to the polling station. These here feet of mine march me to the polling station. These here feet of mine march me to the polling station. Here I go, here I go, here I go. Hey, this little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. Let it shine, let it shine. See this here voice of mine is for singing songs of freedom. This here voice of mine is for singing songs of freedom. This here voice of mine is for singing songs of freedom. Sing aloud, sing aloud, sing aloud. Vote them out, vote them out, vote them out. Vote them tyrants out, vote them out, vote them out. See, here you go, here you go, here I go. Let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Reverend Dr. Liz Theo Harris. I'm the director of the Cairo Center for Religions, Rights, and Social Justice at Union Theological Seminary and co-chair along with Reverend Dr. William J. Barber II of the Poor People's Campaign. On December 28, 1862, on the eve of the moment when President Abraham Lincoln issued the Emancipation Proclamation freeing the slaves, in a watch night service much like this, Frederick Douglass gave a speech, the day of Jubilee comes, that began this way. He said, this is scarcely a day for prose. It is a day for poetry and song, a new song. These cloudless skies, this balmy air, this brilliant sunshine are in harmony with the glorious morning of liberty about to dawn upon us. He then warned, however, that it was unwise for the friends of freedom to fold their hands and consider their work at an end. The price of liberty is eternal vigilance. Two and a half years of death and struggle later, on June 19th of 1865, the Union Army arrived in Galveston, Texas, and the enslaved people of that city the last to do so, learned that they had been emancipated. The memory of that day has since held special meaning for many communities seeking freedom of various sorts. Some know it as Juneteenth, others call it Jubilee Day. After all, the word Jubilee comes from the Hebrew hovel, meaning a trumpet blast of liberty. 
It was said that on the day of liberation, the sound of a ram's horn would ring through the land. These days, I hear the sound of that horn when I speak with homeless leaders defending their encampments amid the nightmare of COVID-19. I hear it when I meet people who are tired, angry, and yet miraculously enough finding their political voice for the first time in the general election and now in the Georgia runoff, voting tyrants out. I hear it when I read escaped slave and abolitionist leader Frederick Douglass's speech on the eve of the Emancipation Proclamation. I also feel Frederick Douglass's sharp reminder from that same watch night sermon of the need for eternal vigilance when I learn of the death of leaders from the movement to transform this world of ours, when I read the stories of so many loss from the pandemic, the poverty, racism, COVID from the Poor People's Campaign Memorial Wall, or hear the nearly 1,000 names from the National Union of the Homeless's Homeless Day Memorial Service. These are, after all, times of staggering danger, but also enormous possibility. Moments that should be met with unbridled imagination, absolute seriousness, and the music of those jubilee horns. Above all, in a world distinctly stacked against us, we must believe we can succeed. And many of you joining us this evening are aware, on June 20th, the day after Juneteenth, Jubilee Day, the Poor People's Campaign launched a moral policy agenda to heal America, the Poor People's Jubilee Platform. It details not just a list of demands, but a blueprint for a, the moral reconstruction of society. It's meant to remind us that ending poverty, ending systemic racism, working to mitigate climate change and halting this country's ever growing militarism at home and abroad is not only possible, but we know that it, what it will take to get us there. This Jubilee platform and all our Poor People's Campaign demands and priorities affirm many of the truths discovered by freedom fighters across the ages, that there's actually enough for everyone and that all are deserving of our nation's abundance, that when we lift from the bottom, everyone rises, that our society desperately needs a moral revolution of values for which we'll have to depend on the leadership of those most impacted by injustice. And that, as Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. once suggested, power for poor people will mean having the capacity the togetherness, the assertiveness, and the aggressiveness to force the power structure of this nation to say yes, when they may be desirous of saying no. Many people have said that this platform and the 14 policy priorities that we launched in December that draw from this platform are just far too ambitious, that such demands are both politically inconceivable and ridiculously too expensive, that even with a new administration that we need compromise and moderation, but we know the benefits of investing in life, not death, far outweigh the costs, whatever they might be. The 140 million poor and low wealth people in this nation are bearing the brunt of these costs and we won't be silent anymore. Over the quarter of a century that I've been engaged in a movement to reconstruct society led by the poor and dispossessed, many have come forward to claim that ending poverty is impossible, that this is as good as it gets, that the cost of addressing inequality are simply too great. Especially as an ordained clergy, as a biblical scholar, rarely has a week passed that I haven't heard someone quote this line from Jesus in the Bible, the poor will be with you always, to make the point that humanity has always known poverty to be eternal, and that its mitigation is best reserved for charity or philanthropy. Indeed, that biblical passage has become yet another tool wielded by supporters of the wealthy to deflect attention from systemic failures in our country to help them further consolidate their power and to, court and to reinforce that social uplift is far too costly to imagine and change of that sort is inconceivable. But the irony of that line from the Bible on the poor is that Jesus was actually critiquing it and the rich by cleverly referencing the law codes of Deuteronomy by talking about Jubilee. In his time, the Roman Empire had created a society rife with suffering and death, as well as its own predatory regime of wealth accumulation. Jesus references perhaps the most powerful prescription for justice in the Hebrew scriptures with the message that there need be no poor person among you and instructs nations 
to forgive debts, to pay people what they deserve, to abolish slavery, to organize society around the needs of the poor. That Jubilee passage of his was never actually saying that poverty was inevitable, but that the poor will be with us always as long as we cater to the rich rather than build a society that cares for everyone. And this is no less true today. This is the eternal vigilance that Frederick Douglass warns from his watch night sermon. As freedom fighters, it is our responsibility to keep organizing, to keep mobilizing, to keep educating and engaging, to build a powerful movement of those who would be free, coming forth in power with clear and bold demands, singing a jubilee song, letting our light shine. We are aware that the price of freedom is paid with our commitment to make it a reality. And may we commit to keep up the fight, to keep up the pressure, to keep up the power in 2021 and beyond. This is the way. And so I thank you for joining us. And I ask you now to turn your attention to a film, a year in review of the Poor People's Campaign, a national call for moral revival. And after you see the accomplishments, which are many, of poor and low-income people, the 140 million who are getting organized in this country, will have a charge from Reverend Dr. William J. Barber, who will tell us what needs to happen in 2021 to make justice and freedom sound. Thank you so much. Thank you for your work. Go in peace. Poverty spans every race, creed, color, and sexual orientation. And all of those numbers combined makes up 43.5% of this nation, almost half of this nation. And any nation that ignores half of its people is in a moral an economic crisis. There's 140 million people who are poor or one couple hundred dollar emergency from deep poverty. The media doesn't cover it. Most politicians don't talk about it. Will your campaign advocate for a complete debate on the issue of poverty in the United States of America? Yes. Not only would I, I already have. Well, you know, I would be thrilled uh, to have a debate on those topics and I would advocate to uh, the powers that be. All yes. the media there, yes, okay. Yes, right. Joy, take and, and Joy has a question. <laughs> I think we should. So yes, I will be a voice for that. Of course. You want a short answer to that question? <laughs> yes, of course. Yes. I love that, yes, yes. That would be fantastic. The purpose of today's event is to discuss the Poor People's Campaign, a national call for moral revival, their nine-month, 22-state tour. All leading to the Mass Poor People's Assembly and Moral March. What we had experienced at the border, a hateful rhetoric of white supremacy that is telling that Latinos and immigrants and children are the enemy. Right. And that rhetoric is coming from the White House. That's right. Forward together! Black one step back! Forward together! Black one step back! So why am I so focused on unions here in the South? Because poverty and racism are systemic problems that, are, that need systemic solutions. We are that solution. Yeah, when you see me marching This is the 
same system that discriminates against those with pre-existing conditions, the same system that ignores the health of those who serve this country, the same system that makes it so people would rather be severely ill than go to the doctor to get help, and also the same system that makes it so people would rather die than drown in debt. It needs to end, and it needs to end now. In New Hampshire, Article 10 says you have a right of revolution. Now we don't have, I'm gonna go get this added in North Carolina. <laughs> so I, let's all pause before we move. I used to be a preschool teacher and I get preschool real fast. <laughs> We will not get rid of our problems by bombing them away, by shipping them away, by throwing them behind bars. We're just trying to go in and deliver a letter. The property owner has asked that you leave the property. Yeah. Well, um, Senator Senator McConnell is my I, senator. I understand. I'm one of but his constituents. I understand. We all are. I understand, but this is private property. Yeah. Oh, we pay God. taxes for him to be here. Can I get you exactly what do you need from us? I'm trying to understand. We got a, a federal homeland security man paid for by, with our tax dollars telling us we can't go. These are constituents, honey. They, they want to be in that senator's office. Police brutality and street violence are all too prevalent. And as a white woman, I'm privileged that I have never had reason to fear authority. But that is not true for our brothers and sisters. So you're from? I'm from Inez, Kentucky. And you are sure not real McCoy. I'm a real McCoy, and I'll be a real McCoy at the march in Washington. I saw the light. I saw the light. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm sick of living in fear, sick of... Uh, letting that silence me. That's, that's why I'm really honored to see a room full of people um, in the area that I was from, the place that like I was so scared would never get better that I felt like I would always have to leave. And we're pleased to welcome uh, Reverend William Barber and Reverend Liz Thea Harris because um, I, I don't know, I, I can't, there are no words. <laughs> there really aren't. <laughs> Being poor and sick often means that I am terrified that someone in office will decide that my condition is just too expensive, that my existence and survival are too expensive. What do we want? What do we want? Health care. Health care. When do we want it? When do we want it? Now. Now. If it's good enough to be in the scriptures, then we need to stop asking ourselves, what would Jesus do and start doing what Jesus showed us to do? People in politics are often specifically advised to speak of the middle class uh, and not to use the word poor or poverty too much. But of course, there's no uh, scripture telling us, as you've done to the middle class, so you have done to me. So if we think about the moral imperatives that are at stake right now in an election like this, we have to think about whether we are making ourselves useful to those who are most vulnerable and those who are most in need. And so we're going to sing um, these simple words to a familiar tune. Rise, shine, tell your story. Rise, shine, tell your story. Rise, shine, tell your story. Justice for the poor. homeless, alone, and I was an addict. Now, I wasn't homeless because I was an addict. I was an addict because I was homeless and alone. True. Oh, oh, freedom. Oh, freedom. 
This is our blueprint, the budget. We found the money. Like you, we know the lies and those other lies and statistics. <laughs> we know that, the, that America doesn't have a problem with scare, uh, money. It has a, a scarcity. It has a problem with the scarcity of consciousness. Let us rise. Let us rise. We are rising. We are rising. Let us rise. Let us rise. We are rising. We are rising. When you never had to be hungry, people in Washington are sending war machines to other countries to build war against others mm -hmm. instead of homes for people here or medical for people here yeah. or food for people here for children that are sleeping in their cars That's right. That's right. that don't have that go to bed hungry at night we must address this issue and in Iowa of all places to come to this stage and not talk about poverty means you ignore a million people in Iowa. That's right, that's right. 100,000 people uninsured. 45% of Iowans do not make a living wage. These debate stages can no longer be silent. That's right. We want we want a debate now. A debate now. For thousands of years. The land we are standing on belonged to the indigenous people. This state is actually named after the tribe Iowa. But it's not just we need Iowa because of the problem, but we need a sound to come out of Iowa. This nation's got to hear from Iowa that Iowa has something to say about poverty and low wealth. Good morning, I am Ross Pellas. And I am delighted and honored to introduce the labor leaders in this country who represent millions of workers who stand on the right side of history, mm -hmm. who stand with the poor and low-income folks in this country. We stand today with, with all of you saying somebody is hurting our people and it's gone on far too long and we won't be silent anymore. I can understand why our brothers in the street are so ticked off when they see what's happening here and then they see how they're treated in the judicial system. And it's the antithesis of democracy. So rise up, we're rising up. Rise up, we're rising up. The developers are trying to throw us out of our community. I can't begin to tell you how many of our neighbors are homeless now. We have listened to the political consultants enough. They say don't talk about poverty. They say we don't, don't say we don't, we don't have the money. They say somebody accused you of socialism. Well, according to some folks' definition of socialism, Jesus was a socialist. So you don't worry about being accused, let's tell the truth. My hero, Dr. King, once said an edifice that produces beggars needs restructuring. Right. Right. That's right. Yes, it does. We need to change the narrative. We need to organize, empower, and educate ourselves. Yo, we are still marching. Welcome, North Carolina. Welcome, HK on J. Let's hear y'all. Well, I'm going off the stage so that somebody else can come. But if I was at my home church, I'd tell you, slap somebody a high five and tell them I'm ready to fight. I'm tired of crying. I'm tired of mourning. And I'm going to fight with love. I'm going to fight with truth. I'm going to fight with marching. I'm going to fight at the ballot box. I ain't got to hurt nobody. I ain't got to crush nobody. But everybody, it's time to vote. I was taught early on that there's no separation between Jesus and justice. I'm here as a preacher. 
because I follow this brown-skinned Palestinian Jew who never charged a leper a copay. So don't even come to me talking about following Jesus if you're not standing with the poor. And candidates are doing now. Two things I want to ask you. I want to look at some interrupt you for one second. All right. I know. It's hard to interrupt all this right, guy. I right. know that. Well, I don't have my pulpit up here, so you can all interrupt right, today. All right. All right. <laughs> See, we have already, just tonight, in this church, we have had more serious discussion about the issues that impact the American people in the half hour we've been up here than I have had in 10 debates. All right? <laughs> And that's all we want. Nobody in the 10 debates, to the best of my memory, and sometimes I forget things, but to the best of my memory, nobody asked me, Senator, what are you going to do if president to make sure that everybody has a living wage in this country? That question has never been asked to me by the media. Mm -hmm. Nobody has ever asked me, what are you going to do to make sure that health care is a human right? That question has never been asked. What we know about our culture here is that we are many people. And as we pray and sing and evoke the spirit of our ancestors, that we also ask that the spirit of the ancestors of the traditional caretakers of these lands be with us. Hello, everybody. It's movement time. Every time we vote, we ought to speak justice. Every time we vote, we ought to speak righteousness. Every time we vote, we ought to vote, speak living wages. Every time we vote, we ought to speak health care. Is there anybody ready to start speaking? Tonight, we are here and the historic 16th Street Baptist Church, where racists thought if they bombed the movement, they could kill the movement. But they didn't know that the people had something so powerful in them that bombs couldn't blow out, fire could not burn out. And instead, people of every race, creed, and color came together and extended to movement. Today, we face forms of political violence, social unrest, 140 million people living in poverty, dealing with systemic racism, systemic poverty, ecological devastation, the war economy, and the false moral narrative of religious na nationalism. And on June 20th, 2020, we're going to have a poor people's campaign, a national call for a moral revival. We're calling on thousands of people to come as we put a face and a voice before the nation and an agenda. We're living in an age now where people think because they post about social justice, that makes them an actual social justice person. That's, that's not the case. Uh, but, but even in the midst of being hot, I hope we have really, really taken in what we've heard today. And what we're about to hear now is even deeper. So we're going to keep going deep till we get y'all to the point where you're like, well, damn, what do we do? And we're going to get y'all to moving and thinking about what this will do, what you will do when you leave here. Because it's just not about you coming here and being a part of this training. It's about what will you do individually and what we will do as a collective. And it's gone on far too long, and we won't be silent anymore. This moment of tremendous pain can just possibly be the final link in the chain of the transformation of major parts of this nation. Hello to all of you. This is the Reverend Dr. William J. Barber II. And on behalf of my co-chair, Reverend Dr. Liz Theo Harris, and the entire Poor People's Campaign, a national call for a moral revival, we are joining you for our first social media, virtual, digital, Facebook Live mass meeting of the Poor People's Campaign, a national call for a moral revival, and the National More Tour, We Must Do More, mobilizing, organizing, registering, educating people for the movement who vote. We come tonight in the midst of an epidemic and pandemic that has caused us, many of us, to have to stay in place. 
We were going to be on the road this month, but we realized that this movement cannot merely stand still. For even before this pandemic hit, there was the pandemic of lies and the pandemic of racism and the pandemic of greed. And 700 people a day were dying because of poverty and low wealth. And 62 million people were working every day without a living wage before they were ever told they needed to go home without unpaid leave or sick leave and needed to use disposable income that they did not have. And so our movement must continue. And so tonight we began with this serious admonition and prayer. Lord, grant us courage for the facing of this hour. Reverend Dr. Barber, you and other uh, African-American pastors are meeting this week to discuss uh, how some of these inequalities can be fixed. Are you looking at this from the perspective of the coronavirus emergency or generally speaking how health inequality can be fixed? Because we could be talking about coronavirus, we could be talking about heart disease, we could be talking about diabetes, we could be talking about a lot of things that affect uh, people of color in this country differently than they affect the general population. You see, the issue is not race, it's the immoral legacy and a reality of systematic racism that's causing so many African Americans to die disproportionately. The United States has all of these open wounds rooted in decades of racist policies and the criminalization of, uh, of poverty. And the coronavirus is revealing that. In a world where pandemics are going to continue to happen, if we cannot guarantee health care for everyone, and have a universal form of health care and basic living wages and basic sick leave, then we are missing the lesson of this moment. Exactly right. That's why I think we can do it. You know, I, I have immune deficiency because I have a chronic disease I've had since I was 20 years old. I've been fighting it for more than 30 years. So I had to immediately come off the road. The hunger pains are hard out here. Our church alone uh, is delivering almost 400 meals a day. And let me honor those who are out there putting on the mask and the gloves and delivering in them. And they tell us that they can't go into homes and little children run out and get their plates. It is hard. It is tough out here for people who are trying to find food, who are trying to go to work, who are trying to stay in place, who are trying to survive. It's hard. It's hurtful. Uh, and we have to continue to, to, to stand up and try to make the difference and fill the gap. Are you saying to us and are the experts saying to us that most of these deaths and infections, in particular of the deaths, are a matter of bad choices, not things that inevitably had to happen? Exactly. We know that there were things that should have been set in place um, from the onset of this um, um, pandemic. This uh, government was reckless and irresponsible in how it responded. Um, it did not do the proper, um, a, uh, ex employ the proper public health strategies to contain the virus and to mitigate the virus. And now the virus is spreading in our communities and the poor and disinvested communities are paying the price for the actions of this government. As I speak to you right now, I'm busy smuggling PPE to my co-workers. This is mass murder. How could you come to sacrificial lives? If we could come to the moral center and about humanity, the pandemic has forced us to have to deal with these issues. And if they are dealt with both in the campaign and after the campaign, we're going to have a society that's really going to move away from some of these false levels. If you're going to fight structural racism and structural poverty, you have to have an infrastructure to fight the structure. It is about building power and shifting the narrative. Some people, Roland, just want to shift the narrative. You can't just shift the narrative. You have to build power. And you also have to know what power is there to be built. I would like to thank you and welcome you. Uh, today we are having our press conference uh, as a part of the Stay in Place, Stay Alive Organized Drive. You know, I often get this feeling that people, uh, you know, you can't see a virus. It's in invisible and it spreads silently, but it is not imaginary. We have to uh, use the public health tools at our disposal to uh, bring this under control and wishing it away will only cost more lives. Holmes County, Mississippi is considered one of the most impoverished counties in the state. 
I was on the ground last year with Reverend Dr. William Barber, co-chair of the Poor People's Campaign, a movement dedicated to seeking justice for the poor. He's not afraid to use his bully pulpit to affect political change. I spoke with the Reverend again earlier tonight to discuss how the pandemic has affected the poorest of the poor. Reverend Barber, thank you so much for joining us. I see you with your mask on. That tells me how seriously you take this pandemic. Reverend, so based on the community that you serve, your perspective, are the states reopening too soon? Were well, they opening too soon at the expense of poor and low, uh, low-income working people and at the expense of the American public? This false choice that you have to either open up or go to work and possibly die is, is a choice. It didn't have to be this way. The issue is to open up properly. And properly means we would make sure that people have health care, made sure that we have testing, made sure that we did the tracking, made sure that we have the PPEs that are necessary, uh, made sure that people had the kind of protections for uh, rent forgiveness and to maintain their waters. But we've not done any of that. And as one low-wage worker said, it feels like we're being led to what is called policy mass murder mm. because we're being forced to go into work for our livelihoods when we should not have to do that. 50-year-old Clara Kincaid is my sister-in-law, and she passed away as a result of COVID-19, leaving four sons and six grandchildren behind. Clara was so sick, but she had to drive nearly 40 miles to another county just to see a doctor and be tested. As sick as she was, doctors didn't admit her. Instead, they sent her home back to our community on quarantine and back to the family where we waited for her to die. Mm. On Monday, May 25th, Minneapolis police officers respond to a call about a customer using a counterfeit $20 bill. Officers arrive and pull the suspect, 46-year-old George Floyd, from his car, placing him in handcuffs. Minutes later, officers lay Floyd down beside the rear tire of the police car. The incident is the latest in a series of racially charged confrontations in recent weeks. Hundreds of people gather in Minneapolis on Tuesday night to decry the death of Floyd. Police officers in riot gear fire rubber bullets at the crowd. By Wednesday, as protests spread nationwide, George Floyd's sister, Bridget Floyd, calls for justice. I would like for those officers to be charged with murder. But we cannot try to hurry up and put the screams and the tears and the hurt back in the bottle to just get back to some normal that was abnormal in the first place. Hear the screams, feel the tears. The very people who've been rejected over and over again are the ones who have shown us the possibility of a more perfect nation. They are telling us these wounds are too much, this death is too much. Reverend Barber, so many things have come together. Poverty, joblessness, the pandemic, police brutality, racial injustice. Now that people are awake, what is the path forward? Well, number one, let's hope that we're fully awake because there's still some people that want to deal with this as though racism, this racism is a spectacle. What made that cop think he could do that to George is, is still a part and parcel of our society where too many people think they can use their power to, to crush people, right, rather than lift people. So we must make sure this moment is not wasted. I, I keep saying that if Barack Obama is JFK, Joe Biden has the chance to be Lyndon B. Johnson, especially in a moment like this. Do you think he could be as progressive on race and class as LBJ? So I think it's possible, but it's only possible if it's rooted in policy. I would say that we need to look at George. And yes, George had that racist cop lynch him. But before George got to that corner, he was being suffocated by the policies of this nation. He lost his job in COVID. He had, didn't have decent unemployment, didn't have decent sick leave. He went to Minnesota to get a job. He got a service job, which we now call an essential job, but it didn't give him the essential things he needed. So by the time he got there on that corner, he was already being suffocated by the damages of this society. We really are calling for a third reconstruction a fundamental restructuring of America in five areas, um, systemic racism, systemic poverty, 
ecological devastation, the war economy, and a false moral narrative of religious nationalism. And you have to do all of those, Chris, if you are serious about dealing with racism and classism and the violence that comes from that. In fact, the text says God will only help us when God hears that we are sick and tired of this injustice. And God doesn't know we're sick and tired of it as a nation. We're sick and tired of all this unnecessary death until he hears a lament, until he hears a cry, until he hears a wailing, until he hears a repenting, a repenting coming up from the street that shuts down the factories and shuts down the, the cities and shuts down the mall. We need lamenting in this nation. This movement, I believe, is not just against one form of racism, but that what we saw on camera made everybody say that that shorthand that George Floyd spoke is shorthand for all our pain. I can't breathe. Um, and Bishop Barber, this issue of poverty predates, obviously, the COVID-19 pandemic. But how has the pandemic made it worse? Well, the fact of the matter is pandemics exploit and live in the fissures and the wounds of society. And, and what has made it worse in the pandemic is we've had three major rescue bills and none of them have focused extens extensively and specifically on poverty and low income of uh, the 140 million people who were already in problems before this pandemic ever hit. A powerful new movement is rising across America. We are the 140 million poor and low wealth people in this country, and we are building the Poor People's Campaign, a national call for moral revival. On June 20th, we will rise together for the Mass Poor People's Assembly and Moral March on Washington, a digital justice gathering. Our nation is at a historic crossroads. But history teaches us that people from all walks of life must build a broad and deep movement from the bottom up. On June 20th, we will come together to lift the voices and faces of poverty in the midst of pandemic for a massive historic online gathering that will embolden us, strengthen us, and prepare us to fight for the kind of society we know we so badly need and deserve. Rise with us. Visit June2020.org. Hi, this is Rob Reiner asking you to stand up for decency, dignity, equality, and justice, and asking you to join Reverend Barber this Saturday, June 20th, for a virtual Moral March on Washington. You can sign up uh, for this virtual march by going to june2020.org and be a part of this amazing virtual march with the extraordinary Reverend Dr. Barber. On June 20th, I'll join the Poor People's Campaign in declaring that these demands must be front and center in this moment. What does the Lord require of thee? Almost 57 years ago, my father, Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr reminded America of the fierce urgency of now. Today, as his daughter, I am honored to add my voice to the Poor People's Campaign, a national call for moral revival, and stand with the 140 million poor people and low wealth people urging America to address with the fierce urgency of now the big issues of poverty and race. There is a coming together of people all across this nation, a fusion movement shaping the narrative that lifts up the 140 million poor people living in poverty in America. Welcome, America. Today, we will hear from the prophets of our time, prophets among the 140 million poor and low wealth people in this country. We are gathered today to call for a radical redistribution of political and economic power, a revolution of moral values. 
to demonstrate the power of poor and impacted people banding together, demanding that this country change for the better. So we give honor to God today. You have heard from the prophets and the people on the front lines. We promised that this stage would be built so that America would have to hear herself and see herself, see her face and hear her voice. We must change this narrative and change this reality. Now we're going to focus our attention on a group that wants to change how the government deals with issues of race and poverty. We're talking about the Poor People's Campaign, a national call for moral revival. July 4th is a time we ought to say, don't give me just flag waving alone. Let's fix the problems that still wave in the face of everyday people. It means don't just pledge allegiance so much to a flag, but pledge allegiance to uplifting humanity. Pledge allegiance to giving essential workers what they need in the COVID pandemic. Pledge allegiance to making sure that every policy we pass helps to ensure that we are one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. What does it mean? We released a summary of the campaign's legislative and policy priorities on June 20th. But today we've released the full comprehensive moral policy agenda to heal America, the Poor People's Jubilee Platform. A statement of values for our country to follow. I always say a budget should be a statement of our national values. What we care about as a nation should be reflected in our budget. This is a wonderful guide to lifting us to a higher standard. Let's have a John Lewis omnibus bill. Let's deal with voting rights. Let's deal with uh, health care. Let's deal with living wages. And let's not deal with platitudes. But the folk in Kentucky, they know the real deal about, how, is, they'll tell us, is Mitch good for Kentucky? Because if he's not doing right for Kentucky, you sure they're not doing right for the rest of us. Yeah, we know that Senator McConnell, McConnell is bad for Kentucky and bad for the country. And the hypocrisy, we're just, we could just bite nails here in Kentucky. If we read the headlines from the past few days here in the richest nation in human history, yet because of the misleadership of this nation, led by Senator Mitch McConnell, taking a pause from passing a stimulus package that would extend unemployment benefits. And if you do not vote, we cannot change anything. He is, it's time to put him in his rocking chair. I don't want to say any bad words, but y'all know what I'm talking about. Send him home. He needs to, I don't even know if he's got great grandkids, but he needs to be there with him. He is bad. <laughs> My friend, let me tell you about Kentucky. The work of poor people in Kentucky, but not the bottom of the foundation. The bottom is where you end up. The foundation is where you start from. Kentucky is not about horse and treasure. Down is about working poor people. Today, Reverend Dr. William Barber stood alongside local religious leaders at the Charlotte Government Center this afternoon. And the Reverend touched on a lot of subjects, but voting was a topic he was passionate about. Lies were at the backdrop of slavery. Lies were at the backdrop of women not being given the right to vote. Lies have been at the backdrop of those who would give more money to corporations than they would give to communities. And we have seen in this convention nothing but a convention of lies, and we're calling it out. The March on Washington's lasting legacy was Dr. King's I Have a Dream speech. What did Dr. King really say in that speech? Dr. King dropped it that day. I mean, he did not hold back. In our collective memory, the March on Washington has even been viewed as a one-issue day or as just a black day, as if the only reason people came together in 1963 was to demand the Civil Rights Bill we got in 1964. But actually, this undercuts the meaning and the power of the original march on Washington. We're, we're facing suffering, untold suffering that this country has never known before. And Mitch McConnell, one man, is standing in the way of us even talking about it, even bringing it to the floor to speak about it, to hear the people's needs, and to have our other senators, both Republican and Democrat, shame on you, 
we know that one of the greatest policy making bodies, in fact, the greatest policy making body, most powerful body in the world is the United States Senate. And so tonight we began a series of conversations with those who would seek to hold uh, Senate seats in various states uh, around the country, North Carolina being the first one that we're holding this focus. I want you to know that we sent invitations to both candidates for this program at the same time. We thank uh, Mr. Cunningham, Brother Cunningham, for agreeing to join us to respond to the priorities of poor and low wealth people in, in North Carolina. And we've not been able to get a response from the Tillis campaign. Brother Tillis chose not to show up for this tonight. We need to make sure we close the, the health care gap by catching those who have come off employer-based care, expanding Medicaid, adopting the public option urgently and right now. This is the call for 2020. And this is your call. We're giving you all the tools you need to be who you want to be at this moment in our nation's history. Tonight, you're going to receive a training from some of the best in the business. The 2020 election is now. We may be 50 days away from November 3rd, but in states all across this nation, people are registering to vote. They are requesting their absentee ballots and they are learning the new rules under COVID-19. We know that this election is one of the most important elections in our history, and that it's our responsibility to ensure that every vote counts and every voice is heard. Nearly one third of the electorate is poor and low wealth. And let many times we don't even hear poor and low wealth discussed in our political discourse. That's an incredible amount of untapped power. And we have to mobilize and organize and register and educate, and we have to vote. But we also took the time to invite both candidates for president to come and to speak to the issues of poor and low wealth people at this gathering. We've not heard from the Trump campaign. Vice President Biden agreed. We're gonna talk about our obligations to one another, how we benefit when we help one another. Ending poverty will not just be an aspiration, it will be a theory of change to build a new economy that includes everyone. And I wanna be part of your movement. But I'm gonna focus it's like a laser, laser beam on the bottom third. Because as you just said, Reverend, if you lift up the bottom third in the healthcare, in the housing, in education. But this is McCracken County where we have 17% poverty. We have, we have 16,000 people in McCracken County that are food insecure. And that includes 2,300 children. And that is here in Paducah where his office is located. And so he is hurting his people. He is hurting his Commonwealth. And so I encourage everybody to call McConnell and to let him know that he has been there far too long and we will not be silent anymore. This is the Capitol Police are engaging in an unlawful assembly. You need to clear the street immediately or you'll be subject to arrest. Today, Today. we remember, we remember. What, Sister what Sister Ruth fought for and died fighting for. We remember, we remember what, Brianna what Brianna died fighting against. Died fighting against. We, declare we declare judgment, judgment. on the unholy, on the unholy. Activities, activities in the Senate. In the Senate. As I think Sunita mentioned, apart from being uh, one of his grandsons, I'm also a biographer of the old man. Uh -huh. I've lived with him uh, as a scholar, as a researcher also for a long, long time. I remember reading a quote somewhere where your grandfather Mahatma Gandhi said about Christians that he didn't really have a problem with Jesus. <laughs> it was some of the Christians that he kept meeting, or at least those that were using the name. My greatest prayer today is that if he were to meet me and those of us in the, in, in, that are people of faith in this Poor People's Campaign, uh, that he would not be disappointed. 
you know, Black Lives Matter, I view as, you know, very profoundly a theological statement. It is. All this movement in the street and all of this coming out is like the democracy trying to breathe, establishment of justice trying to breathe, providing for the common good, promoting general welfare, trying to breathe, saying something's not right here. How do we tackle poverty? Raise the minimum wage. I'm for $15 an hour, but let's debate about what, what it should be. I think we, should, we can't debate right now because Mitch McConnell won't allow debate on these things. I think we need to do it. I think we should also protect workers' rights to unionize. I think that really helps keep, keep people out of poverty. And none of these things can happen unless we tackle corruption in Washington. So I have a plan to do that as well. I'm the only voice that said, yes, we need to remove monuments and, and marble uh, mon monuments and granite monuments and take down names, but that doesn't do any good if we don't remove the barriers. And it's the l barriers in healthcare, in housing, in education, uh, in employment. You were able to travel to 10 states today without even leaving your living room. Uh, we've uh, we've seen some powerful caravans in, in 20 uh, cities. This is Reverend Dr. William J. Barber II urging you to vote early in the 2020 general election. And this is actress and producer Erica Alexander. We must vote to ensure living wages, access to health care, and clean air and water. And I'm Lawrence Fishburne. Our people are hurting and dying, and we cannot be silent anymore. The voters of North Carolina are essential workers in our democracy. And the essential workers in North Carolina deserve respect. In the exercise of this discretion, the court finds that justice requires a new trial. The defendant's conviction is vacated, and he shall have a new trial. Your Honor, in light of the court's ruling, um, I feel safe in the same. I'm pleased to say the state has no interest or desire to call the case for trial subsequently. <laughs> Uh, Mr. Chair, I would like Mr. Sharp to be released as soon as physically possible. Hello. We still have courts running. So I just got back from Durham and I voted. I registered and voted. Yeah. And uh, it felt real good to be a uh, part of that and, and to just help make change and, and use my voice that's been giving me my right. You must register your truth. Register where you stand on all these issues by casting your ballot. And remember, nobody would lie this much and work this hard to take something from you that wasn't valuable. So let's look at the, the healthcare disparities of underlying conditions that cause that and food deserts and lack of access to nutrition and but also implicit bias in healthcare and, and not listening to mothers. And there's so much, too much to cover in this short amount of time, but that's how I define systemic racism. And I think that it's great that we're having conversations about policing reform and criminal justice reform, um, but we also need to acknowledge that those are symptoms of a bigger problem that we need to address. Come on, come on, come on, don't you want to vote? Come on, come on, come on, don't you want to vote? Come on, come on, come on, don't you want to vote? Yes, I want to vote. An artist's duty, as far as I'm concerned, is to reflect the times. I think that is true of painters, sculptors, poets, musicians. As far as I'm concerned, it's their choice, but 
I choose to reflect the times and situations in which I find myself. That, to me, is my duty. And at this crucial time in our lives, when everything is so desperate, when every day is a matter of survival, I don't think you can help but be involved. Young people know this. That's why they're so involved in politics. We will shape and mold this country, or it will not be molded and shaped at all anymore. So, I don't think you have a choice. How can you be an artist and not reflect the times? That, to me, is the definition of an artist. Yes, I want to vote. Vote, everybody. Vote, everybody. Vote, vote. vote everybody. Yes. invite you to join us again tomorrow on Election Day from 8 a.m. Eastern all the way until 8 p.m. Eastern. At the top of the hour, every hour, we'll be going live from National City Christian Church in Washington, D.C. We'll continue our prayerful action that evening from 9 p.m. to 11.30 p.m. Eastern, hearing from voices from all over the country. We are black, we are white, we are Latino, we are Native American, we are Democrat, we are Republican, we are independent, we are people of faith, we are people not of faith, we are natives and immigrants, we are business leaders and workers and unemployed, we are doctors and the uninsured, we are gay, we are straight, we are students, we are parents, we are retirees. We are America and we are here and we ain't going nowhere. You know, America has this strange dichotomy. On the one hand, you've got all these tributaries of justice and love and mercy, but on the other hand, you've got all these tributaries of racism, hatred, and violence and injustice. Both are America. That's who we are. Hello, all my brothers and sisters across the nation. I'm Reverend Dr. William J. Barber II, co-chair of the Poor People's Campaign, a national call for moral revival and president of Repairs of the Breach. And my co-chair and dear sister, Reverend Dr. Liz Theo Harris is joining today. She'll be following me as we attempt to talk to the nation about where we are and the Poor People's Campaign and the work ahead of us. We are continuing to organize. The Poor People's Campaign, a national call for more revival. We'll be organizing caravans. Ohio Live Cam looking good. Okay, Ohio's ready to go. Hi, my name is Janina Gorman from Altoona, Pennsylvania, and I'm here in front of the state capitol in Harrisburg with our Moral Monday caravan in their remembrance. My hometown of Albany, Georgia was 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 the hot spot when it first started. Yes. Over 4,309 people have died in Maryland. Utah's named after the Utes. Uh, here, at this capital, you know, they need to do a lot more work to help us out. It's really hard for me to continue on and to have no voice to have no say. Um, I think what we want to also show here is that this is happening all over the country. We're doing these caravans at state capitals and, and you can see some of them now. Um, again, in 25 different state capitals in Washington, D.C., folk are coming together with this petition, with power. You know, we're mourning, we're saying we need a smooth transition, and we're coming forward with demands for a, for a just relief package and for the first policies of the new administration to be about lifting the load of poverty, about protecting essential workers, about expanding health care, about all of the demands that we in this campaign have. And so um, there's amazing organizing folks all over the country um, in state capitals, and it's, it's amazing to be here um, uh, with everybody today. Uh, just look at this, look at this, take this in. We're out here today because our hearts are broken. 
This award will only make us do more, but we call on you to join us and not just going down the same old language, the same old tired rhetoric, but to elevate the rhetoric to moral concerns in this moment because people are hurting. We thank you for all the work you're doing. We ask you to join in this powerful fusion movement that can indeed heal, heal and transform this nation. Because we know when we lift, when we organize, when we build power from the bottom, everybody, everybody, everybody can rise. What can people do to cope? How have you been encouraging people to remain hopeful during such dark times? Well, you know, several things. The Pope talked about this. This is an encyclical, this whole issue of loneliness. And loneliness is real. As I said, there were people who were facing it before COVID. It's gotten worse since COVID. But one of the things you do is you join a movement that's fighting back, that's not accepting things the way they are. Study after study says over 200 thousand people didn't have to die. Well, in their names, we need to stand up. And, and when you stand up in a movement, it keeps you from feeling like you're in it by yourself. So join a movement. And most of all, let's love one another. Let's love let's one love another, them. speak truth to one another. And in every way we can, even if it's virtual, let's hug one another and hold on to one another and know that together, together, not separate, together, we will make it through these days. My brothers and sisters, you have seen a powerful, powerful year in review of what we have done together. And so I'm not going to try to rehearse that. I simply want to be pastor for a moment and say a few things to us in these final hours of the year 2020 as we head toward. We leave a day we'll never see again. We head toward tomorrow that we've never seen. I want to first implore us to know that we can't forget 2020. Some are saying, let's just leave it behind. Let's just forget 2020. The worst thing you can do is forget where you've come from. Forget the struggles forget the pain. We can't forget those whom we lost many needlessly because of bad, bad decisions by those in power. We can't forget them. We must call their names and we must act in their names. We must move forward in their names. No, we can't forget 2020. We can't forget the bad public policy because we've got to remember it so that we will fight against it. I've been thinking all this year, what if we had remembered 1919 and learned the lessons of the pandemic then and the lies then and the racism then and the 650,000 people that died then that didn't have to die. Maybe we wouldn't be here now. We have too much amnesia in this place called America. So we can't forget. But not only can't we, we can't forget those we lost. We can't forget the lives destroyed because of bad public policy. We cannot forget those who loved us, who lifted us, those whom we learned from. And so, as we head toward a day we've never seen, let us not forget all of the lessons of the days we are leaving that we will never see again, that we might have the wisdom of that knowledge as we move forward. But then not only must I say tonight we can't forget, I must say we can't lose faith. I have a very dear friend who has taught me something. It's a simple thing, but so profound. She told me that her father said it to her over and over again. 
and she taught it to me and I am forever grateful. She said her daddy would say when he was struggling with disease in his body, God may not do it today. He can, but he may not do it today, but he will surely do it tomorrow. I will, as long as I live, never forget those words she taught me. And we must remember that as we move by faith. There are some things we don't like today, but tomorrow is still possible. We must have faith in the God of tomorrows, yesterdays, today and tomorrow. We must have faith yet that weeping may endure for a night, but joy can still come in the morning tomorrow. We must have faith and believe that what we've experienced in these days does not have to have the final say. God may not do it today, but he can surely and will surely do it tomorrow. The slaves believe that. The abolitionists believe that. The people before us that began the first poor people's campaign, they believe that and now their seeds of sowing are coming up through us. We must hold on to our faith. We must not forget and we must keep moving forward together, forward, forward, forward until everybody has health care, forward until the poor are lifted and everybody has living wages, forward until we have the kind of infrastructure that lifts all people from the bottom up, forward till vaccines are free and everybody is tested and everybody is protected and we have full comprehensive COVID relief forward until we cut all of those bloated areas of our military budget and war economy and use it for real national security, healthcare, wages, infrastructure, education. Our way is forward. We don't forget, but we don't stay in the past. We must move forward together. One of the last images you saw on that year in review was Dante Sharp, my brother. 20 some years in prison for a crime he did not commit, but he kept believing in tomorrow and the possibility of moving forward. When I visited him in prison and washed his feet inside of prison, and I saw his commitment to truth, commitment to doing what's right. He could have pleaded. He could have said he did something that he did not do and gotten a lesser sentence, but he could not tell a lie. He could not bow to the system and he kept moving forward and his mama kept moving forward and his aunt kept moving forward together. And as they kept the faith, others came and joined. And then we all moved forward together. And then a judge agreed together and a DA agreed together. And then witnesses that had said one thing recanted and joined the forward together team. And Dante was set free. We must, we must keep moving forward together. God is not through with us and God is not through with this nation. So tonight is not an ending. It's a step to a new beginning. And in that new beginning, let us say forever and today, forward together and not one step back. God bless you, love to you all, and I'll see you in the march that's going forward until justice comes, amen. God of many names, we mourn the more than 350,000 and many more to come lives that have been lost this year. 
and for the hundreds of thousands who die every year from poverty. Each one a special soul connected to a community and to families. We cry out and lament along with them in their pain and sorrow. These lives were lost not simply to disease or accidents of nature. They were murdered and their families were torn apart by a system that benefits from keeping people poor. A system that covets the abundance of this world and denies people the things that they need to survive and to thrive. This death-dealing system divides people against each other and blames the poor for their own poverty. We cry out in righteous anger and judgment at this system and against those who are its handmaidens, who hold it up, who benefit from it, and defend it as God's will. But we also rejoice, for we know this violation and destruction of life wrought by this unjust system will not endure. It will not have the final word. And we know this because those who are knocked down by it today, just like throughout history, have stood up and shown us clearly the evils of this system. And they have shown us what we have become as a nation and how to get organized and fight back. It comes from efforts like North Carolina Fed Up, where low-wage workers who were already fighting for living wages in a union came together and organized to feed their community, showing not only how the system has failed to provide, but also how society would look if caring for people was at the center. We see it in the rebirth and growth of the National Union of the Homeless, where some of the most impacted by the evils of this system have organized and exposed the way it increasingly has no use for people and is willing to lock up and discard human life. They too not only reveal the sin of the system, but make clear the demands needed to transform it, a human right to health care and to housing and the dignity and respect for all life. We see it in the work of the Border Network for Human Rights, where immigrant families along the U.S. southern border have organized to show the violence and inhumanity of our immigration system and how by fixing it we repair the well-being of our entire nation. And we see it from leaders with the Apache stronghold in, in Arizona who were able to stop a massive multinational copper mining company from taking possession of one of their most sacred places of worship. And in doing so, the Apache once again, like so many indigenous people's struggles, have shared a vision of a way of being in the world and with each other that values all life and seeks to live in harmony. We rejoice at these many and many other hopeful signs brought into the world this year, forged in struggle and showing us a more just and loving way forward. We pray for comfort to the brokenhearted and we pray for the continued strength of our movement. And we stand by with each other, watchful for signs that justice is coming. God of all life, accept our prayer. Tonight, we gather here as a community at the horizon of another year, reflecting upon a year of inflection, held in a space of liminality of what once was and what will be. There is no singular way to describe what this year has brought with it. We have experienced the out of the ordinary, mourning, anticipation, urgency, and transformation. We gather as a community watching and waiting for a new year, marking both a close and a beginning. We join here collectively to offer our prayers, our intentions, our heart's desires. We lift up our collective sorrow for all that was lost and all that did not come to pass. We lift up our moments of joy, even in the midst of chaos. We lift up our hopes for a new reality that is rooted in justice, abundance, love, and community. We pray for a future of greater community and less isolation. We pray for a future where we live rooted in radical love instead of the confines of divided hate. 
We pray for the end of the interlocking injustices of systemic poverty, systemic racism, ecological devastation, war economy, and the false moral narrative of religious nationalism. We pray for a future that takes seriously the notion that everybody has the right to live. We watch and we wait. We protest and we persist. We dream and we demand. We offer these prayers as action towards a new dawn, a new day, a new morning, a new world. Amen. Come on, come on, come on. Don't you want to vote? Come on, come on, come on. Don't you want to vote? Come on, come on, come on. Don't you want to vote? Yes, I want to vote. Oh, come on, come on, come on. Don't you want to vote? Come on, come on, come on. Don't you want to vote? Come on, come on, come on. Don't you want to vote? Yes, I want to vote. Stop complaining, come on. Don't you want to vote? You just stop complaining, come on. Don't you want to vote? Stop complaining, come on. Don't you want to vote? Yes, I want to vote. Hey, come on, come on, come on. Don't you want to vote? Oh, come on, come on, come on. Don't you want to vote? Oh, come on, come on, come on. Don't you want to vote? Yes, I want to vote. Oh, come on, come on, come on. Don't you want to vote? Don't you want to vote? Come on, come on, stand with me. And Don't you want to vote? Oh, yes, I want to vote. Oh, come on, come on, come on. Don't you want to vote? Come on, come on, come on. Don't you want to vote? Come on, come on, come on. Don't you want to vote? Yes, I want to vote. Yes, I want to vote. Yes, I want to vote. Vote, everybody. Vote, everybody. Vote, everybody. Yes.